So many of us have those games in our lives that have brought us nothing but frustration and rage. Maybe you had a hard time saving all the Electoons in Rayman 1, or maybe you couldn't figure out where the hell to go in Mirror's Edge. Well, for me, for many years that game has been Hurdy Gurdy, a puzzle platformer centered around hurting animals. My hatred for this game has been a running joke between my brother and I for almost a decade, and, as a lark, I decided to put it on my Twitter poll to see what game I'd review first. Well, guess which game won. But, upon playing the game over a decade later for this review, it's not nearly as bad as I remembered, actually. It's got issues, don't get me wrong, but I'd say it actually leans towards being a pretty decent game. So, without any further ado, my name is Jeff, and today we'll be taking a closer look at the mixed bag that is Hurdy Gurdy. Alright, so let's pop in the game. Okay, Eidos and Core. They develop games like Tomb Raider and Soul Reaver. Good sign, good sign. Okay, looks like we have a loading screen here, no problem. Got some nice artwork to look at. Well, this is taking a bit. Oh, thank God, almost done. Was there seriously a loading screen for the loading screen? I mean, granted, the second one was quick, but... Why? Why? The rest of the loading screens in the game could be pretty lengthy as well, but thankfully the first one was the only fake out, and each area has more art for you to look at while you wait. A bit annoying, but not a deal breaker. So how does the game itself start off? Well, we get a long dulling shot showing off the environment around Gertie's hut as the sun rises. Everything looks pretty good for the time, actually, and the music's very charming. Enchanting, even. But... Shouldn't there be opening credits here? I, I mean, usually opening shots like this are used to not only introduce the audience to the world, but also show off the main people and companies involved in the project. Without the credits, it just kind of feels like... padding. Very pretty padding, though, I'll admit. But after that, we see our hero waking up, and what the hell's with the turd bun? <laughs> this, this is the worst case of bedhead I've seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, our young hero Gertie, son of a master shepherd, wakes up and realizes that his dad is going to be late for the big herding tournament. When his dad doesn't wake up, he runs out the door to look for help. Sweet, a good opening. It was short, sweet, and to the point. But now for some gameplay. The game starts you off in a big and open area to let you get used to the controls and familiarize yourself with things like animal pens, your map, and collectible bells that you can use to unlock bonus content. It's pretty easy to get around, though you won't actually be able to run and jump until you get the magic boots at the end of the area. Until then, Gertie is slow and loses all four momentum the second he's in the air. Kind of makes me wonder how planes would work in this universe. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've enjoyed our hour-long presentation of the uh, safety procedures. Uh, we're looking at fair skies and should be arriving in mid mirror in about uh, two and a half hours. We're about to take off. Please enjoy the flight. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it appears that our team of engineers has, uh, failed to duct tape magic boots to the plane, so, uh, we cannot take off. I would like to remind you at this point that there are no refunds, and, uh, please enjoy the stale pretzels. Once you do have the boots, though, the platforming and just getting around in general is much quicker and much easier. But even though the platforming is much easier now, you'll still have to fight with one of the game's biggest sins, the camera. In big open areas, the camera works fine for the most part. You can control the zoom, and you can dolly it around Gertie as you need. But once you're in a small space or run next to a wall of some kind, the camera either gets stuck or starts flipping out trying to reorient itself. If you have the time to fidget around, it's a simple enough fix, but this game has a lot of time segments and running away from predators, so the camera becomes your biggest liability in every challenge. And speaking of handicapping your visibility, let's talk about the map. The map in this game is kind of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it gives you a color-coded and easy-to-understand layout of the area that really comes in handy when you're herding animals in new terrain. Helps you find exits, herdable creatures, and helps you keep tabs on predators in the area so your animals don't get eaten. But on the other hand, when you're using your map, you sacrifice your peripheral vision. Even if you keep it half-obscured, the map is still completely opaque and blocks enough of the screen that it becomes easy to run into hazards. 
I guess the idea is that you shouldn't rely on it too heavily, but I feel like making a more transparent map in the corner would have been a good compromise and prevented a lot of frustration. Though, to be fair, I do have a hard time memorizing things, so maybe others wouldn't have an issue scouting ahead or only checking the map periodically. But we'll get more into gameplay in a bit, back to the story. So after getting used to the controls, you talk to one of the game's many gypsies, whose entire face is one giant schnoz for some reason. I I interesting design choice. The Nose Gypsy then sends you to the next area where you talk to Grandma, who tells you to get help from a man named... Yig... 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 His name's Yig... Jeez, it's like when his parents named him, they just threw candy at a keyboard and ran with whatever it typed. What kind of idiots would come up with a name like Yidrazil? Oh. Upon meeting him, Yidrazil immediately opens up a book and drops some exposition on us. This book contains the history of this island since its creation. It tells many stories, some of which have become legends. I would like to tell you a little of the oldest of these legends. The story of creation. Wait a minute. Story of creation? Oh god. This man isn't gonna help me save my dad! This is all just an elaborate ruse to get me to go to Sunday school! Damn you, Grandma! Damn you! But seriously, he explains that an evil spellcaster named Sadorf possesses the first acorn, an ancient seed that contains the essence of life and is vital to the island they live on. Apparently, the only way to get it back from him is to beat him in the tournament, so he casts a spell on Gertie's father who was the only real threat to his victory. What happens if the acorn isn't returned? Why is something so important up for grabs at a tournament? Why would Sadorf just willingly hand over the acorn if he lost? And why does he want to keep the acorn to himself anyway? Huh? but he's evil. It must be stopped. Yeah, the story's a little hazy on the details, but it's a mix of Hero's Journey and a coming-of-age story, so, eh, it's serviceable enough for me, I guess. Yidrazil then tells Gertie that he has to fill his dad's shoes and train to beat Sador from the tournament in his place. And after just a little bit of coaxing, Gertie's training begins. Alright, hurting, the main mechanic of the game. What you got for us, Drazzy? Now, you'll see this wooden thing? It's called a pen. Okay, pen. Container of livestock. Gotcha. What am I hurting? And you see these little critters? They're called dupes. Ugh, my sentiments exactly. Ah, uh, yep, these pink chickens are called dupes. They're the simplest to herd as you only have to run at them, but they're also the single most irritating creatures in the game. It, it starts off pretty well, you run at a bunch of dupes and they group together and you chase them to the pen. Seems pretty convenient, but if you fidget the wrong way or just speed up just a little, just a little bit, the group scatters in every direction and gets stuck or killed. Luckily during your training, Yudrazil gives you a herding stick that you can plop on the ground and the dupes will just regroup around it. A pretty good fix for the sporadic behavior when you're not running around predators. But aside from dupes being a pain in the neck sometimes, the herding in this game is actually pretty great. Every creature reacts to you, their environments, and each other differently, and it makes for some fun and mildly complex puzzles. Here's a quick rundown of how the creatures work. Blurps poison gromps, gromps kill dupes, dupes float on water, water kills bleeps, bleeps hover down cliffs, cliffs kill dupes, dupes run from Gertie, Gertie runs from gromps, gromps also eat honks, honks swim in water, water drowns Gertie, Gertie is chased by grimps, but grimps can also be led by Gertie, Gertie leads music ants, music ants attract normal ants, normal ants attack other small creatures, but unlike other small creatures, ants are aggressive towards gromps, but gromps can be distracted and led away by Gertie, and Gertie can lead gluters. And a lot of these different interactions involving Gertie are thanks to the herding instruments that you collect throughout the game. There's the magic flute that not only makes most animals follow you single file, but it also has Gertie play a flute cover of the level's background music. That's pretty cool. And there's also the horn that gets the attention of Gromps and can even distract them away from eating other animals. The only real issue I've run into as far as the instruments are concerned is that the horn can be a little selective on how it affects Gromps. Sometimes the Gromps will start coming at you before the horn blowing animation is finished and it really cuts down on vital escape time. There are also a few instances where Gromps wouldn't react to the horn at all, and they just continued killing the other animals. In one level, I got right up to one and just blew the horn like 20 times before I got a reaction. Luckily, the horn also scares away dupes, so not too many were killed, thankfully. Though to be fair to the horn, it might be that the Gromps themselves are a little bit buggy, because the other animals react to the horn just fine, and... Well... Gromps also did this on occasion when they caught up to me.
But the other animals have some issues as well, the main one being that they all have a tendency to get stuck on a lot for one reason or another. It's very frustrating to fix, and a single stray dupe can cost you entire challenges, like the ones against Efren and Red. <laughs> check this out, these dupes even had a hard time getting down the waterfall. So we've covered the animals and instruments involved in herding, let's talk about pens. It's pretty simple, each animal type has its own personalized pen, and each pen holds a generous number of creatures. Pens are usually found in small clusters, too, that's pretty convenient. I mean, just take a look at this, the bleep pen is conveniently located right next to the gromp trap, sweet! I'll just get these guys in here and call it a day. Wait, what? Oh, oh, oh god, why? Where did he get a fishing pole? Why can't I stop this? I'm so sorry, you fuzzy little bastards! <laughs> So, uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and never do that again. After the training session with Yudrazzle, Gertie is sent out to the world to hone his skills and make his way to Termin Island. And what a world it is, too. The size of the world map is actually kind of impressive, and it's filled with a variety of good-looking environments. You got your mountain peaks, canyons, forests, ancient temples, the setting for Friday the 13th for some reason. And I especially love Foxtown Bridge. It's a smaller area, but it is a gorgeous night scene. Another cool thing about the different environments is that some of the creatures have different color schemes based on their surroundings, like how this blue and white gromp blends in with the snow and mountain peaks. It's visually pleasing and makes evolutionary sense. And along our way through these different biomes, we come across a cast of colorful characters like Red the Magician, Ephraim the Elf, Belder's Ghost, Santa Claus? Uh, yeah, Santa's in this for some reason. He doesn't really do anything, you just break him out of some ice, he throws you some bells, and... Just kind of leaves. Well, that's kind of random. What was even the point of him being there? <laughs> ah, shoot. Give me a sec. I'll get a light. Stupid, cheap piece of good for a year, my ass. Come on. Where the hell is it? Aha! This'll do. Loomer from Mont Bisney's Booty and the Feast, what are you doing here? I'm here for a brief and unnecessary cameo. Oh, that's awesome. Do, do I get some kind of reward for finding you? Collectibles. Cheap and pointless collectibles. <laughs> oui, oui, baguette. Anyway, legally distinct knockoff characters aside, while we're on the subject of characters, let's talk about the mixed bag that is the voice acting. The voices are great matches for the characters, but it sounds like the actors didn't know what lines they were reacting to. Almost all the inflections sound so... unnatural in the conversation and are accompanied by these long, awkward pauses between lines. I'm collecting as much flour as I can to make bread for the tournament. I'm going to the tournament too. How far is it from here? Oh, young lad, I'm afraid it's a very long way indeed. You've got to go past the ruins of Midmere, through the forest, and then once you get to Foxtown, you can sail to Tournament Island. That is a long way. I guess I better get moving or I'll never get there in time. That's the spirit, lad. I'm sure you'll find your way there. The characters themselves seem like they'd be enjoyable, but you only see a majority of them like once or twice. 
Oh, Grandma's kind of funny. I hope to see more of... Oh, well, uh, how about Sarah? She seems... Okay, what about Efren and Red? The instruments they gave Gertie were key to his success. Jessica? Builder's Ghost? The Pirate? Santa? Ho, ho, ho. Okay, 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 okay. All right. What about Sadorf? He's the main villain of the game. Surely we see him more than- Well, who the hell is actually present throughout the game? Well, at the very least, he Drazzle makes two more appearances. The first of which is at Pirate's Cove, which he explains is where he trained Gertie's father to defeat Sadorf. No one has ever beaten his father's time here, and it serves as Gertie's final test before setting off for the tournament. In addition to being a fun puzzle, this challenge serves as something of a coming-of-age moment where Gertie, a boy who just recently had no hurting skill to speak of, surpasses his father's skills and takes his place as the island's hero. Story-wise, it's probably the best part of the game. It's just a shame that there wasn't more build-up to this. With a little more character development, I could see this moment having a lot of emotional impact. But for what it is, it's still not too shabby. Once you prove your worth to Yudrazzle, you then make your way to Foxtown, where you can finally hitch a ride to the tournament. Here you run into the only other reoccurring character in the game known simply as the Baker. No real name, just... Baker. Sure, one-time side characters get real names, but the only two characters that you see throughout the entire game are just named after their most obvious traits. Ah yes, I recall in Kingdom Hearts where Clown Shoes, Dog Face, and Duck Wizard encountered better pick for main character pants in Hollow Bastion. <laughs> Such a great moment in the series. But I digress. Throughout the game, you occasionally run into the Baker, making his way to cater for the tournament. Once in Foxtown, the Baker tells us that the local pests known as Gluters have stolen all of his bread. It's like this every day. I bake the bread, they take the bread. I bake the bread, they take the bread. I bake the bread. After this mental bread down, Baker and Gertie are then threatened by a street tough and are told not to walk around town at night. He also warns that Baker better have the food ready by sunrise. Now. You better have that bread done by tomorrow. Some people might not believe that it was vermin that ate the bread. By sunrise, Baker. Sunrise! After he leaves, Gertie makes a deal with the Baker to round up the gluters and get more ingredients in exchange for a boat ride to the tournament. And quite frankly, I would have rather swam to the island because Foxtown is the worst part of this game. The level is split into three parts. Trapping the gluters, stealing the ingredients from stores, which is a little weird, but at the world's at stake, so I guess it's for the greater good. And getting to the boat. And you do all of this while sneaking around the street tufts in town, which, on paper, sounds like it could be an interesting wrench throw in the mix. But unfortunately, it's just another long and irritating stealth mission in a non-stealth related game. It's not that the stealth is hard. You can get pretty close to the guards without issue, and they don't even react to your flute when you're hurting gluters past them. It's just a lot of tedious waiting and trying to navigate around blocked off alleyways. And for a single level that eats up so much of your time with just sheer tedium, it doesn't even contribute much plot-wise. The entire point of the level is to do some chores to get a boat ride to Termin Island, but earlier in the game we helped a pirate get rid of a giant bird, so they could have just had Gertie use his boat and skip this area entirely. The pacing would have worked out better too because we helped the pirate right after the final training session with Hydrazil. So really, the only real purpose of the level was just to finish out the story of a reoccurring background character. The whole thing just feels like a cheap way to pad out the final act and it really took me out of the game. But, I have to admit, all the tedium was worth the payoff because Termin Island is a great final challenge for this game. It starts off with a simple challenge from the gatekeeper to get in. It serves as a warm-up for hurting predators and prey around each other in a smaller area, which is a constant theme throughout the tournament itself. Not too much else to really comment on, it's just a good warm-up. After impressing the guard with your mad-hurting skills, he grants Gertie entrance only for us to find out that it's too late and Sadorf has already been declared the winner. But when the baker declares that there's one more contestant, Sadorf agrees to this last challenge and the games begin. But before I start gushing about the tournament itself, let's talk about Sadorf for a minute. Sadorf is surprisingly not a very typical villain. Although his hoarding of the acorn has dire consequences for the island, he isn't some sort of malevolent schemer out to destroy or conquer the world, he's just kind of a cocky asshole. It's not even clear if he knows the full effect of what he's doing. And he isn't universally hated either. When it's revealed that Sadorf has won, most of the crowd is actually cheering for him. And that seems a little weird though, considering that the longer he's champion, the longer the island is at risk of dying. To be fair, during the applause, Sadorf polymorphs a heckler in the crowd, so you could argue that they're all being coerced, but it sounds pretty genuine to me. And on top of that, he's not even a sore loser. When he's defeated, he doesn't try to back out of giving up the acorn, he just kind of stands there awestruck and lets you drazzle hand it over to Gertie. 
While he isn't the most fleshed out antagonist in the world, and I'm pretty sure you only see him for like a grand total of 60 seconds, I have to give the game props for at least not resorting to a typical destroy or rule the world type of villain. I'll concede that my take on Sadorf is a bit of a stretch, but I don't have to reach at all when I say that the three rounds of the tournament are by far the best puzzles this game has to offer. Even with the forgiving time limits, you have to think very quickly on your feet and take full advantage of the game mechanics that you've learned up to this point. Let's take a look at the second round, my personal favorite, as an example of how good this finale is. First off, the music in this round has a great climactic tone to it that definitely sounds like something that would play over a nail biter. Which is fitting because this round is definitely the most complicated out of the three and took me a good handful of tries to get it down. Just to give you an idea of how involved this challenge is, here's the solution I came up with to beat it in just over eight minutes. Trap the Gromp at the far end of the level, clear the Gromp traps of honks, and lead them to the pen by the first Gromp. Lead the Gromp in the middle of the level to one of the newly cleared traps. Go back to the beginning and poison the Gromp on the lower level. While he's poisoned, push the block out of the way and line up the blurps for later. Have the Gromp chase you to the cleared traps from earlier. Lead some of the honks from the beginning to the pen off to the left. Lead the nearby small group of honks to the first honk pen. Lead the rest of the honks at the starting area to the pen off to the left side. Go back to the start and kick one of the blurps off the edge and the other to the nearby Gromp. While he's poisoned, push the block out of the way and lead the group of bleeps away from the Gromp trap that's by the left side honk pen. Lead the last Gromp into the trap. Get the last few honks into the first honk pen. And finally, lead the bleeps into the pen behind where the last Gromp was originally sitting. Yeesh, talk about a fucking marathon. N not gonna lie though, I loved every second of it. I had to really think to work out the hurting order, but it wasn't so difficult that I felt like rage quitting. It's the third porridge bowl of hurting puzzles is what I'm saying. My only complaint with it is that it wasn't used as the finale. Well. That and the honks got stuck on this corner a couple times. That was kind of annoying. Now don't get me wrong, the other two rounds are pretty good as well. You have to utilize more herding mechanics and work on herding different creatures around each other like with the second round, and they work pretty well as puzzles. But again, the order of these challenges feels... off. The way it's ordered is pretty much from easiest to hardest and then it all ends with the medium difficulty round. It seems like with how much more complex the second round is and with the more climactic tone of the music that the second and third rounds should have just been switched. Round three is good and all, but after the intensity of the second round, it feels more like a victory lap than a final challenge. But again, aside from a few nitpicks, Tournament Island was a great way to close out the game. And uh, <laughs> what, uh, what made it even better for me was that the final creature that I penned in the game was a Gromp that trapped himself as he caught up to me and knocked me away. Ha <laughs> ha! Got you now, bitch! Jorioken! Damn it! After that epic victory, Gertie is awarded the acorn and Sadorf accepts defeat. We then get one last little cutscene of some of the characters having a victory bonfire as Gertie's dad marvels at how much his son has grown over his adventure. This ending would have been heartwarming, if a bit rushed, if not for two blaring details. One, obligatory pedo bear joke. And two, <laughs> that Ted's voice does not match his appearance. Take, take a look at this guy. How old would you say he is? About 40, 50? Around there, right? <laughs> then why does he sound 16? He's grown so much. Huh? And saved us all in the process. I would never have believed it. He doesn't sound like a rugged Master Shepherd. He sounds like the guy handing you popcorn at the movie theater. God, that is just such a weird thing to end the game on, man. But that's it for Hurdy Gurdy, and I gotta say, I actually don't mind eating crow on this one. While the game is bare bones in terms of story and characters, I found myself really enjoying the gameplay. Granted, the camera maintenance and occasional buggy AI are really frustrating, but they weren't bad enough for me to put the controller down. And the game has a bunch of other positives, like a variety of pretty environments and a great soundtrack to go with them. So the game is definitely a mixed bag for me, but I'd say the experience was more positive overall. If I had to put a letter grade to it, I'd say the game is a solid C+. A very different opinion from the one I had going in. So those are my thoughts on Hurdy Gurdy. Have your own thoughts on the game? Let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, show your support by leaving a like, sharing it with friends, and subscribing if you want to see more. Now it does take me some time to make these reviews, but I also do several streams a week with my friends, so you won't be without content. And remember, no matter how bad you think your hair looks today, it could always be worse. Good night, everybody. <sighs> yeah.
You better pay me for that shit. I'm not degrading myself for free, you know? Yeah, yeah, you'll get your money.